So thank you so much. It's been really a privilege to hear the previous speakers and also be able to get their sort of insight and experience and make sure as well that I'm not going to cover a very similar similar topics as, as previously spoken. So you've obviously heard from the previous speakers about more of the scientific underpinning behind firearm identification and ballistics and the concepts of forensic physics in that sector. But I'm hopefully my presentation will take you beyond the scientific element and it will get you to really consider what happens after the process or before the process in terms of the, the forensic laboratory. So in over the past 10, 12 years or so, after my PhD in 3D imaging and um, forensic firearm identification, I've been doing a range of scientific research um, covering shooting incident reconstruction, um, gunshot residue analysis, um, uh, firearm identification, etc. And so, and I've worked and, and I've had the real privilege of, of working alongside and learning from practitioners all across the globe. And what I understood through my Churchill Fellowship and the travels that I made is that when it comes to the investigation of crime, whether it's firearm related crime or, or any other type of crime, there's, uh, there are some really critical issues um, that we all face, whatever country we're from, about how that actual information gets utilized by investigators uh, and within the criminal justice process. And so what I'm sort of trying to do is to try to look at how can we move forward to make the value of forensic evidence, forensic reports, and you know the time that practitioners spend analyzing, comparing, and making interpretations and conclusions about their work have bigger impact in the wider criminal justice process and uh, have more value for police and for investigators. So that's why the topic of my title is shooting for the stars, shooting for the future, reflecting on our current practice, but also where the courts also need our practices to go. So while I won't go into the scientific aspects behind these because other speakers have, have uh, spoken about them, I'd be more than willing to do follow up or, or answer any questions about anything that I do cover. So, what I mentioned, there are these, these issues and, and where do they stem from? In terms of forensic practice, whether it's forensic physics, crime scene investigation, forensic biology, forensic chemistry, what, what's our journey? In terms of the past, we started in the oranges, origins of the discipline with very limited scientific knowledge. In the past, the society, the behaviours, the laws, they were very different to what they are now. And as a result of the limited knowledge, the limited technology that we had back then, there were lots of miscarriages of justice that are emerging, that we are finding out about. And when we start looking on past cases, cold cases, there or, or unanswered, unsolved, or even crimes that were prosecuted, but we now realize with greater knowledge of science, greater technology, greater sensitivity, that actually some of those conclusions weren't right. It has a fundamental impact on how the public and, and how police and investigators value the, the forensic evidence that we actually have. And so that's one of the things that we're dealing with in the present. We've got lots of barriers, whether they're financial, whether they're people related, whether they're resourcing in a much broader context that are stopping us from actually being able to use forensic evidence in the manner in which it, it could be used. So we need to identify what the barriers are, what the challenges are, understand why they're there and who and, and what can we do to make um, things better and, and improve things for the future. So we need to identify who are our enablers, what are our enablers, and who are our change makers, who are our leaders that are going to take not only the science, but also the use of forensic science into the future. What are the threats? 
what are our resources going to be in the future? Can we predict what that's likely to happen? Well, over the last 20 or so years, particularly in the UK, Europe, US, et cetera, those resources are reducing, not increasing. So how do we actually get better, advance the, not only the science, but the use of forensic science in investigations to help society, to help reduce crime, to prevent crime, to detect crime uh, and, and solve crime? In the UK, we're at a, a current low of 7% of our, all of our reported crime is actually solved. So that, that number hasn't been increasing, that's been reducing over years. So what else can we do? Well, we can absolutely maximise our forensic potential, whatever forensic discipline we're in. And I'm hoping that today's uh, keynote talk will expand your mindset if it isn't already, as to how we could potentially do that and what the future might look like. So ideally, our evidence submission workflow, you know, we want it to go from crime to court in as fast a time as possible, but we know that that often takes years or at least months, depending on the type of crime, or it may never even get there. There are loads of different stages and uh, parts of the chain from the time of recovery of the item or the time of the crime to going into a police property store to then get submit submitted or, or to a CSI unit to then get submitted to the lab in the concepts of forensic ballistics. We're often the last process, whereas actually we could be developing processes that work simultaneously, you know, examining finger marks at the scene, taking DNA swabs at the scene, and then allowing that forensic evidence to get to the forensic ballistics lab in as timely process and, and situation as possible. And so every, every new location, whether it's within the same building or in a different building, slows down the process. And every single unit has their own time that they will take and allocate to doing their process. And it's often not fast enough. The US, for example, are now down and getting terms of forensic, um, linking forensic cases together in, uh, for firearm crime down to less than 48 hours. And many in labs in the US still don't do that, but some do, even really, really, really high gun crime uh, cities are able to do this by changing their approach, changing their mindset, changing the, their processes and, you know, trying something new. So it can be done if people want to make it happen. So what are some of the challenges and, and practices that, that we face, not only in forensic ballistics, but I think also uh, more broadly than that? We know that there is inconsistent terminology across policing, across forensic science, within the public and how often do I hear the terms bullets being used instead of cartridge case or, or ammunition or cartridge, you know, the, the, the terminology, the understanding of it just isn't there. How firearms work, the type of firearm related evidence is actually really, really broad, yet a lot of people just focus on firearms. They might also know about bullets and cartridge cases, but that might be it. And from our experience and my research in the UK and Europe, and, and to some extent the US as well, it's very much you know, focused on a, a smaller uh, amount of, of firearm related evidence. Whereas actually there's manufacturing facilities that are clandestine, that are illegal, that we could be maximizing and, and actually identifying at crime scenes um, or during police warrants and executions much more rapidly. Generally, we have a, a mandate to investigate one particular incident at a time. But actually, a lot of those incidents uh, are linked together, not e even if it's not the, the forensic item that's linked, it's the people that are linked together. Uh, and actually, where do those items come from? How how firearm crime been linked? And so actually a trafficking approach could be a, a manner in which we actually reduce crime by stopping the supply, reducing the demand for those firearms. The various procedures, even you know, within a, a or a country, differ. the processes differ, the systems, the technologies that have access to differ, and that also has barriers to stopping us investigating crime across borders. Particularly if you work in a laboratory or in a police 
uh, on a border with another country or, uh, or uh, an, another jurisdiction. As a result, if, if we've got different technologies that can't share information, then compatible with each other. Again, we're missing opportunities to actually detect crime link crime. Sorry, if someone, thank you, could uh, turn off the microphone. <laughs> um, so, and there's insufficient data sharing, you know, usually based on prior history, lack of trust, things like that. And investigators don't understand, um, really fully understand, they've got lots of other responsibilities. So it's our role as forensic scientists to help educate them to, and to help write reports in a way that enables them to use forensic data whether it's a, a linkage report or a, a, a conclusion saying that the, this, this firearm was linked to this evidence or this ev these evidence show that these crimes are linked together, the same firearm was used. We need to help educate them to use our forensic data better because I know that there are jurisdictions where, you know, and there are officers that don't understand and therefore those re reports aren't utilized to the best of their capability or if at all. Also, as forensic scientists, we need feedback. We need to know that the work that we're doing is having a fundamental impact on the criminal justice process and we're convicting and supporting the conviction of the right people for the, for the crimes that they've been, they've been charged for. And so, you know, this is a holistic process. Yes, the firearm uh, and the forensic laboratory plays a critical role and the advancement of that is really vital, really important. But if other parts of the criminal justice system are not working effectively or aren't uh, you know, as advanced and, and able to understand what we do, then or the public don't understand what, what our evidence says or what it can do, then ultimately we're not going to get the convictions that you know, the evidence supports necessarily. So there is a paradigm shift that is that has started that is also coming uh, it started in forensic speech science um, and it is moving into other disciplines of fingerprint and finger mark evidence as well as into firearm uh, and ballistics so i'm working with dr jeff morrison and his data forensic data science team uh, he's an expert in forensic speech science and uh, the work that he is doing in that field, we're now applying to other, other forms using machine learning. And, and particularly that seems to be um, the movement moving forward, looking at what DNA is, what is done, looking at calculating a likelihood ratio of the of two things coming or being from the same source. But to do this as well, to implement it into practice, we've got to use a multi-agency approach We've got to work better across borders and we've got to make our efficiency and our effectiveness as timely as possible, ideally reporting results in less than 48 hours, because anything longer than that and investigators can't use the data to help their investigations to actually get witnesses to talk to, to get them to open up and we've got to stop focusing on on focusing on really high uh, profile or high um, or really major crimes. Actually, a lot of the breakthroughs come through when it might have just been in terms of firearms uh, related crime. It might just be someone shot a stop sign or a cartridge case was found in a car. Uh, we don't actually know what crime has been committed, but that tiny bit of evidence has actually been and, and linking it to a person, having it in proximity with a person has allowed investigators to make critical breakthroughs in a series of multiple linked incidents. But you know, if we don't look at all of the evidence, collect all the evidence for all firearm related crime, there are really big uh, gaps that we're going to miss uh, at, at you know, taking shooters off the streets and identifying even who those shooters are. It's really important as well that we reduce bias in our process, that has been something that's been um, in, an issue in our courts. Um, and we have to use more objective systems. So using things like gunshot detection systems have you know, opened our eyes to the fact that our evidence collection processes, often when it comes to firearm related crime, are not as good as we think they are. 
by having these gunshot detection systems, they've identified um, that in, in the US, for example, at least 80% of, of shootings are never reported to police. And they've identified that actually the, the evidence that they've collected from the scene, albeit their crime scene investigators are ex extremely well trained, are, are very, very competent. The nature of firearm related evidence and the fact that it rolls, it gets kicked, it gets goes down drains, it gets taken away on people's shoes or in cars or, it, you know, it gets lost within an object and you can't find the entrance, um, particularly with low velocity uh, projectiles. Um, actually, there is much more evidence not collected at the crime scene, you know, for lots of reasons as well, you know, time resourcing, you know, the severity of the crime. And as a result, that's having a fundamental impact on our ability to solve cases. Also, um, using the and, and actually creating intelligence and intelligence across the world is something that um, the, the police, the security, and also forensic labs are not, they, they haven't really focused on creating in the past, but there has been, and there is a real shift to use and to develop and to um, advance crime gun intelligence. So there are loads of low tech opportunities that we can do using people and processes. You know, it's not always about spending a lot of money to buy new technology um, and utilize the latest advances in science to actually make things better. One of the fundamental things is we need to bring key stakeholders together, you know, every part of the criminal justice process and create uh, accessible training materials that are co-created by those key stakeholders and shared as broadly and as widely, not only within a jurisdiction, but internationally as others. Also consider the entire workflow, as I mentioned earlier, from the time of the recovery or the time of the crime, right the way through the criminal justice pr process, so that all forensic labs can actually come together and work out the best approach for different types of crime scenario, so that we can minimise how long the evidence is taking to get through the chain and maximise how fast it takes us to get the reports back to the investigators. We can do that by creating visual workflows to help those that aren't experts in the field understand what uh, and help them with the decision making process. Make sure that they're submitting the evidence in the first place to the, the crime scene unit or to the lab, uh, et cetera, and that they're applying any any decisions or any any procedures properly, because even in um, the UK, the US, we know that that they aren't doing doing that. Um, also to look at frequently analysing data um, to identify what emerging trends and threats are, are actually out there. You know, are there new firearms coming in being trafficked that we aren't aware of? Are there craft produced or illegally manufactured firearms um, and, and ammunition? You know, don't just focus on the firearm. What also about the ammunition is, is coming in? We also can evaluate and do research between different disciplines and sectors and evaluate how well that's being done or, or what impact that change has made and then share the outcomes of the case you know across all actors so forensic scientists talking to policing um, lawyers talking not only to policing but also to forensic scientists so we know what value the work that we're doing in the lab is actually having so this little diagram, um, and apologies if it's quite small for you to see, um, but it's really about looking at how many different parts of that workflow we can actually generate intelligence. You know, we can look at generating intelligence through um, looking at the crime data within the police force, you know, con conducting searches and analysis of the police data entry. We can do exactly the same thing at, in the laboratory, you know, in forensic, uh, and some laboratories absolutely do this and it's brilliant, but others don't yet. Um, so we can have a look at what types of firearms, what calibers, what, where it is, what about the geography of where these crimes are occurring? Is it in a particular type of um, uh, built, uh, you know, uh, residential area? Is it in a commercial area? you know, and, and try and identify these emerging threats and, and trends that might be 
by becoming. If we don't actually analyze the data though, we're not going to actually know that these things are happening necessarily. Particularly if your, your agency is quite large, your lab is quite large, and you've got high volumes of casework coming in. Also, we can look at, you know, identifying the number of inferred guns. So basically, we haven't recovered a firearm, but we know from looking at um, the fired cartridge cases uh, or the fired bullets, that there are a certain number of guns been used in that shooting and that they either link or don't link to particular uh, crimes other shootings, for example. So we can use absolutely our three dimensional imaging uh, and automated um, correlation algorithms to help us identify um, current crime to previous crimes that are, have been um, detected and, and evidence that's submitted by the lab, um, as well as the comparison microscopy that um, others have already mentioned. But some of the other things that we, you know, are being undertaken in the Netherlands, for example, is actually putting somebody into the lab that um, looks at the case context prior to um, the forensic examiners actually conducting their analysis to make sure we're removing any contextual bias about the case that could influence um, the the. So, you know, subconsciously influence our decision making and the conclusions that we might reach to strengthen the value of our um, our conclusions for the court. Also, um, making sure that any forensic comparison that we do, whatever the outcome, so whether it's uh, we don't think it's these two bullets have been fired from this gun or we do, then <clears throat> I think you know, we need to ensure that we're, we're undertaking peer review. So two examiners are looking at exactly the same evidence independently, blind of each other, uh, for all those conclusions to, again, to make sure we're not uh, introducing um, confirmation bias into our process. Uh, additionally, you know, getting uh, those reports back to investigators um, you know, within as short a time period as possible. Um, and then tracking and evaluating the case outcomes for continual enhancement of the laboratory, of our procedures, of our practices, all the way through, and then cycling that background. But forensic scientists, whatever they're doing, can't do this on their own. You know, they have to have support of their leadership and their management in order to do this, to, to make change. They also have to, they, and they should be, be looking to work together to do this. So in the US, they've got crime gun intelligence centers that um, draw together law enforcement, forensic laboratories, and also intelligence analysts as well uh, as crime scene investigators. They even have um, dogs, so forensic dogs um, that are trained to, to work as part of that team as well. In South Africa, though, they're also working with communities as well. So they actually have members of the communities um, forming kind of social media groups with the Metro, Metro Police so that they can actually um, get intelligence about what's happening in those communities out, you know, out there um, faster than they would be reported to police or they may never re be reported to police. But also we have to consider the court outcome and your local academic institutions um, are also will have vital um, resources and, and knowledge and experience that can help you to, to increase um, your training provision, help to increase the, the knowledge, understanding and the work that you do and can help you evaluate the changes that practitioners will make uh, and see if those changes have been worth, worth that, that pain, uh, financially or um, personal uh, change. So what about the future? Well, whether you like it or not, it really looks like it's artificial intelligence. So using machine learning, trying to use more objective mains, and they're not fully objective because they're still created by humans. Um, but to trying to create objective methods of being able to support examiners. This isn't about replacing them. This is about supporting their perceived subjective um, conclusions 
it, and about maximizing the information that's available, but is too much for our brains to comprehend because there's just this big data available. So we've already used machine learning in crime prediction, predicting crimes going to happen and then deploying police resources to help them uh, stop that crime from happening to reduce crime. We've also starting to look at firearm related intelligence. So serial numbers that might have been obliterated. How is that person how it, that's doing that obliteration? How, how are they doing it? Are there any particular um, ways that they're doing that? Uh, that are quite unique, a little bit like a bomb manufacturer. You know, they they have a signature of, of doing in a particular obliteration. So can we determine that as a criminal armorer or there's a particular manufacturing process um, and, and a workshop that's been established to create these illegal firearms, this illegal ammunition um, or do any modifications to what may be legal firearms? We're also applying it to shooting instant reconstruction. So my PhD students just submitted a, his thesis looking at um, assessing a witness victim uh, or um, perpetrator statements and using machine learning to, um, when we're doing a reconstructive testing, to actually um, also consider whether the distances that are being proposed um, actually make sense, whether they work, also trying to calculate uh, the impact velocity and the muzzle velocity um, based on just impact damage alone. Uh, also looking to support um, that distance estimation with the expected um, 3D uh, collected data um, of the impact to be able to, to make those predictions. Also looking at predicting what type of weapon, so not just uh, a shotgun, but whether that particular firearm and that particular ammunition that may have been seized from a suspect predict, you know, when we do that reconstructive testing, we can use machine learning to determine whether that is, is it, it supports um, that hypothesis or not. We're also employing um, machine learning, as I mentioned earlier, to calculate likelihood ratios um, for the, the, how likely it is that um, a particular fired uh, cartridge case it, we're doing at the moment, whether it came from a particular firearm or not. And this, there are existing methods using score-based data from um, technologies like IBIS uh, and EvoFinder, however, we want to utilize the raw data. That's what we should be starting with, not the scores from the comparison process. Also looking at the component manufacturing process and trying to identify um, you know, the, the type of firearm for more difficult firearms, such as ghost guns, 3D printed guns, et cetera. And we're also using machine learning, uh, not me personally, but uh, they have been using machine learning to help them make court decisions. Uh, and whether the, the jury could be even replaced uh, with a machine to actually take on board all the data that's associated with the case and make a, a decision around guilt, um, which could be potentially more objective. I'm not saying that they are more objective. I'm just saying that this is already what's happening and it seems to be growing in its application. And it's likely to be where... Um, the more objective systems are going to be introduced to support examiners uh, and enhance the value and the confidence of the court system and the, the jury or, or the public in how forensic evidence is being utilised to try and minimise those cases of miscarriages of justice occurring again in the future. So my final piece of, of, of understanding and, and knowledge about you know, the, the work of forensic physicists, about the work of forensic scientists and the work within the criminal justice system, not only in my country in the UK, but globally. Success will only happen if people, processes and technology work together. And fundamentally, if any one part of this doesn't doesn't function, doesn't isn't looking about the future, isn't risk. It isn't willing to make the risk or take 
<laughs> willing to risk making change and trying to make things better. It's going to stop that success. It's going to only make things harder for our practitioners within the laboratory. And so, you know, the people are, to me, the biggest thing in either being an enabler or being a barrier to us being able to advance not only the science but also the practice and the value of forensic evidence within the criminal justice system. So thank you very much for your time. If you're interested in, in looking at beyond the science and, and considering kind of global perspectives around um, and the consequences, the control of firearm related crime, um, we've just released a new book. So we wrote a, 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 I wrote a chapter in there with a colleague, Sarah Watson. But <clears throat> I've also um, written blogs, um, spoken uh, and recorded podcasts that people might be interested in the UK um, and international context around policing firearms and wider aspects of crime gun intelligence, um, but also kind of any publications as well. So thank you very much for listening. There's my contact details if anybody did want to um, ask me any questions, get in touch afterwards. Um, and I look forward to hearing from you. Thank you so much for your time. <laughs>